Um, this is Guo He, who is a, a program manager at the Department of Energy Solar Energy Technologies office. And uh, I'll hand it off to you. Thanks, All right. Chloe. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Uh, good morning, everyone. Do you hear me well? Good. Yep. All right, so uh, once again, my name is Guo Huyuan, and I work at the DOE's uh, solar office. So very glad to be here. And for, before I get to my presentation, I want to thank uh, the organizing committee for putting together this uh, important event, in my opinion. And I want to thank Brian Johnson and uh, Abe, uh, Joey Edo, uh, Bob Lasseter, and Yashin for uh, hard work in the last year. And I think, uh, you know, I, I think this is probably the biggest uh, uh, gathering of uh, reform inverter event in the world, if I'm not mistaken. I, I know there's probably 70 people here. Uh, a few years ago, uh, when we were talking about the uh, reform inverter, I think that maybe just a handful of people know, uh, you know, at least in this context, what we're talking about. But now I'm really excited to see uh, the faces and the caliber of people uh, who are here today. So um, I want to just give an uh, overview of what we are doing at the DOE's solar office and talk about a, a lot of the exciting work that we're doing in the space. And I would say that this is one of the most exciting areas uh, in, in our focus, uh, I would say in the next uh, number of years, um, and uh, I'll explain why. On the screen first. So um, the way that we do business in the DOE is that we uh, have, uh, we support uh, research uh, with our funding opportunity. I'm going to just show uh, two uh, recent uh, announcements here. Uh, one is the current on the street. Uh, it's a large uh, uh, investment in uh, all solar uh, technologies. And the group that I'm leading is called system integration. We have $44 million to be invested in the next uh, a uh, couple of years, uh, so just uh, you, you can follow the, the website. Uh, the concept papers uh, is still on the 14th, May 14th. And uh, recently we announced the assisted uh, funding opportunity. Uh, we are funding 10 projects there. So, uh, and just, you know, this gathering kind of gathering is important for us to develop our program to understand what the research community is uh, thinking about the next big problems and uh, we'll uh, support that uh, through our uh, funding initiatives. And it's not just the solar offices, it's just uh, uh, DOE as a whole, we have a grid modernization initiative. Uh, we're collaborating with other offices to tackle uh, some of these uh, really hard and complex problems. So uh, one of the, uh, the best success stories in the wind and solar industry in the last decade Really the cost reduction, I'm not showing this on the slide, but it's really the, the cost, significant cost reduction in solar. So in the solar space, we're talking about, the, you know, most of you know the Sunshot uh, initiative, which uh, we uh, target to reduce the cost of solar by 75% by the end of the decade. And that was accomplished um, uh, in 2017, so uh, dollar watt was accomplished. And that spurred the, the rapid growth in the, uh, you know, installation of solar. Uh, as you can see in the graph here, this is from EIA. So today, uh, not today, but it's at the end of 2017, uh, as a country as a whole, uh, we're generating uh, about 2% of the electricity with solar, about 8% uh, with wind. And, uh, and that's only gonna grow. Uh, in, in the recent years, right? That's the 2017 number. And if you look at, uh, you know, in geographic areas, in, in different locations, uh, you know, the, the chart on the right, you can see that uh, in California, they're meeting their electricity demand uh, with solar about 15, 16%. That was the 2017 figure. And it's more than that today. Uh, in different states in Iowa, uh, Mark knows this better than I do. Uh, you know, wind is the most, uh, uh, you know, uh, significant of uh, generation resources uh, for Iowa and some other states in the Midwest. So, uh, and, uh, you know, we are at the cost of a paradigm change uh, at this point uh, with the uh, increase of renewables and uh, storage as well. 
All of these are based on uh, inverters and power electronics for their generation. And uh, so I think that's why we're here. Everybody has a sense that there is uh, a, a paradigm shift. That there's an opportunity uh, for you know doing and operating, uh, designing and operating the grid in a different way. And I think uh, there's a lot of exciting work to be done. Uh, you know, in the future, in the next probably uh, uh, foreseeable future for us to to look at. So here is a, another uh, snapshot of uh, you know uh, just instantaneously how much penetration wind in California. So this is uh, uh, we're talking about five minutes uh, intervals that we call that real time, real time that in, in Korea is actually uh, five minutes intervals. Uh, in California, you know, in 2018, they were uh, uh, they had 45 uh, percent penetration for wind and solar. I mean, actually, utility solar in in, uh, in September of 2018, and uh, you know, wind and solar and other other renewable together, uh, they were serving 74, almost 74 percent of the load uh, in a five minute interval. So you know, instantaneous penetration is much higher. And a lot of these renewables, if we just talk about wind and solar, they are you know power electronic based systems. So we are already there. So it's it's not a hypothetical issue. It's a it's a it's a real issue now. And um, part of the uh, solution today, uh, without the grid farm inverter, is curtailment, right? And a lot of wind and solar are being curtailed uh, just for the reliability and safety of the grid. So now coming back to what we do at the DOE's uh, solar office uh, in our system integration program. So we're supporting, again, the research development administration of uh, uh, grid integration solutions for solar energy uh, with, uh, you know, reliable, uh, resilient, and secure, and affordable uh, attributes uh, in all those solutions. So we look at, the, as you can see that in the, this uh, diagram, we're looking at both bulk power system uh, integrated uh, solar as well as distribution uh, system integrated solar. So those have uh, different type of challenges. And we have also uh, focused on the other layers, so to speak, and the communication layer where you know, a lot of the controls, digital controls need to com need communication and cybersecurity layer that is a, you know, a new topics and new priorities uh, for the DOE as as a whole, uh, obviously you have to consider the market layers uh, as well. Um, and all of these are actors in the subsystem that are uh, interlinked together. So we cannot look at uh, each component by itself. We have to look at uh, the system as a system of subsystems, right? So this is a really just a kind of a, uh, exemplification of our approach to look at the problem, to address these problems. Right? system approach uh, for grid innovation. We're not just uh, looking at the individual technologies. Obviously, we have focus areas, but uh, uh, we really want to understand the, the interconnection, interdependency of different, these different technologies and uh, look at it from the system perspective. So the pyramid really uh, is talking about you know, the, uh, how we organize our research, uh, starting from the enabling technologies and power electronics is our uh, fundamental enabling technology for solar. And we uh, go up the, the chain and look at uh, you know, how we can put these uh, uh, enabling technology together uh, into the situation wireless and controls and go all the way, go all the way up through planning operation and grid services. Like grid services is the, the level that the customer and the suppliers meet right, uh, in the market, both at the transmission distribution level. Um, so uh, the biggest challenge that Mark said, uh, I totally agree with that characterization. We're, we've been using at the DOE uh, variable renewable generation versus intermittent. I think that's even better. Uh, we, we've been trying to correct people uh, in nomenclature as well. Uh, and this is a, uh, it's not fascinating because intermittent is a, it has a negative uh, in, in it, uh, but this is really how it should be categorized. So variability is, uh, a nature of the wind and the uh, solar generation just because of the, uh, it depends on weather. And we do have a very good understanding of that variability where solar is a little behind 
wind, but we're catching up pretty quickly. So solar forecasting uh, is an uh, uh, important uh, um, program, a sun program in our portfolio. Uh, so we look at uh, you know different uh, uh, forecasting horizons, uh, both in near term and long term. And uh, we actually currently have a solar forecasting research portfolio that is active. Uh, um, so uh, we we also have a PV plus storage program. Uh, this is called Shines. Uh, this uh, is the last year of that program. Basically, we're looking at the synergistic uh, uh, controls and optimization between PV and storage. And Mark actually mentioned that uh, as well. Uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, benefit to be gained by looking at the PV storage and low control together rather than looking at them individually. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, different uh, ways to, to, treat, to look at it from a system perspective, but, but uh, uh, we, we actually have uh, uh, some good successes in this area. Um, I'm showing the common microgrid program uh, in this uh, diagram, and they recently they just made a major milestone in uh, actually uh, demonstrating in their PV plus storage plus control uh, in the island mode, they did the testing with a mobile generator. They, they were able to uh, open the switch and then run the, um, the microgrid uh, test uh, as part of the deliverable for the project. So that was very exciting. Um, power electronics, uh, we have uh, actually Jeremiah Miller uh, and Harry, uh, both from our program, they are managing uh, this program uh, now for, for the DOE solar program. And uh, so we're looking at the power electronics uh, in two perspectives. One is uh, to uh, look at the power electronics themselves in terms of um, uh, controls and uh, uh, efficiency and reliability. But the, the more interesting uh, aspect of this program is uh, really looking at the controls uh, from the grid interface uh, perspective. And uh, um, we're in the year one of, we we'll just finished year one of this program. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, reports and uh, results to report to the, to the community uh, in the next couple of years. If you are guys are interested, you can come to me or uh, both of them uh, to get more information about the Power Shining program. Uh, we, we have a, a program called Energize, and this is uh, really looking at the real-time system operation at the distribution system. So basically, we're talking about uh, uh, employing a large number of sensors and communications to um, look at uh, the behavior of the uh, DER devices, whether it's you know, PV or um, storage, and uh, understanding how they generate uh, and how they perform to inform the grid the operating system uh, to, to better manage the grid. So we have a, a large portfolio there as well. Uh, this is, as I mentioned earlier, this is uh, 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 the, the most recent initiative from, from our program. This is looking at the situation awareness of the PV systems and using that asset to uh, provide uh, emergency or a backup generation for critical infrastructure. This is, uh, uh, we have confirmed that too. So we have just launched this program. Forecasting, I mentioned that earlier. So this is the second uh, round of the forecasting. We're looking at uh, uh, both the forecasting techniques themselves uh, in terms of power and irradiance, irradiance first and the solar power generation forecasting. But more importantly, we're looking at uh, integration of that forecasting knowledge into the system operation. Um, and actually we have one project that is looking at the benchmarking these different uh, technologies and techniques so that uh, the industry can understand, uh, uh, you know, compare uh, the different techniques. Uh, cybersecurity is uh, relatively new in our program. Uh, we are, uh, you know, paying more and more attention. We actually, we're starting to uh, get engaged in, in this area uh, just because this is uh, uh, probably one of the weakest point uh, in all most of these digital generations, right, DRs is, uh, in particular, because it's really hard to understand, you know, where uh, the 
uh, the threat could come from just because there's so many of them. There's a scalability issue as well. And, and a lot of these DR devices are, are not uh, controlled and managed by the utilities. So that's another challenge as well. All right, let me know how much time I have. So, uh, so resilience uh, is a topic uh, on top of the list as well. I mean, I mentioned a few things uh, before. So it's, uh, reliability, resilience, security, affordability, right? Those are the four main attributes in the, you know, the, in all our solutions. So resilience comes uh, up, uh, you know, more and more in the national discussion just because of disasters, uh, whether it's a fire, whether it's a hurricane, whether it's a flood. So uh, we have started uh, looking in this area uh, a few years ago, and this is a, a GMLC, uh, we call the RDS program that was started two years ago. And a few people here in the room are actually uh, the lead for some of those projects. Uh, so I'm just, uh, I just want to mention this one project uh, where uh, uh, it's led by the Sandia. Uh, they are looking at uh, connecting the resilience design of a community, a city, a community uh, with a consequence basis. So it's not just the you know, power system resilience, but they're talking about the resilience of a community and how the resilience of a power system can support and help the resilience of a community. So they have a constant methodology to do that. And uh, the, uh, one of their uh, you know, key partners is uh, 100RC uh, organization in uh, a lot of cities that are helping them to uh, understand the problem of resilience community design. Uh, I'm really excited about the, that project and, and the, the program as a whole. Uh, so by the way, all these are on our website. So if you want to know more about these, you can go to our website as a first start and then uh, you can come, obviously come to, to us to ask more questions. Uh, we also are very active in supporting Puerto Rico recovery. Uh, it's uh, more focused on raising uh, kind of uh, uh, search and uh, uh, technical support activities. So we're, uh, you know, uh, again, some people in the room National Labs are supporting that effort. Uh, we're looking at the, uh, you know, from, uh, the, the entire system from transmission, distribution, generation in, in Puerto Rico, and see how the DOE's, uh, you know, uh, technologies and research and know-hows can support um, in the recovery of Puerto Rico and support uh, them to achieve their goals of building. Uh, a sustainable and uh, resilient power system for the future. Uh, DOE as a whole, uh, we're, we're from uh, DOE's uh, uh, Energy Efficiency and the Renewable Energy Office, and we are working with the other offices, uh, Office of Electricity and uh, Nuclear and uh, Cybersecurity Offices. Together, we're uh, working on the Grid Modernization Initiative. Uh, and some of the projects that we're looking at are large-scale modelings of the power system uh, at the different scenarios, with the different scenarios. And for us, we're obviously our contribution is the scenarios with high penetration of solar, and that we work together with wind. So we're looking at the high penetration of solar and wind, uh, and we also are working with uh, other offices to look at the, the interdependencies of the different infrastructures, including natural gas, including communication and a transmission distribution system. How to model this complex system to make it more uh, resilient. Um, and uh, so here is uh, another, uh, people have probably have seen this many times. Uh, I just want to show it again because we're very proud of this work. This is showing that the renewables, solar and wind as well, is capable of providing great services at a large scale. And this is showing that a 300 megawatt uh, uh, solar plant, if you operate it at 10% below its uh, headroom, before its capacity, uh, and the uh, capacity in, in the graph it shows that it's a, you know, it's a green line, and if you operate it at the right line, you know, 10% below it, uh, it can follow the automated uh, generator control signals very accurately. So 
is able to provide that from a technical technology point of view, it can provide that services for the, um, the low volume services, um, you know, for, for the operation. So how do we open up uh, the, the market or the, the mechanisms, the market mechanism, incentive mechanisms to uh, encourage this type of behavior of developers, the solar uh, power plant owners uh, to help uh, to address some of the reliability issues by the technology itself, not just as an add on, you know, all, not as the uh, service provided by other generators or peakers, but by the technology itself. Wind can do this, solar can do this, storage can also do this, obviously. So, uh, and that's a question to, uh, I guess, the NERC and FERC, right? So, um, and then um, I'm going very quickly here. So, uh, one of the uh, uh, Unity we have uh, at the DOE is a fellowship program and different type of uh, fellowship programs. We're really, uh, you, know, you know, for this industry to thrive, to grow, we need uh, new talent. And uh, at the DOE, we have fellowship programs where we're recruiting talent as well. So for professors, if you have a good student who wants to work in this area, uh, just uh, uh, send us a note. Uh, we'll be happy to evaluate their rather than have a mount uh, in growth in this area. So um, I have two more slides. slides. I just want to uh, talk about this topic. I mean, this is my personally, uh, you know, kind of one of my favorite topics uh, for me, very, very program. Um, so we founded this project uh, a few years ago. Ryan Johnson was the PI. And this is a great for me, Inverter. How do you uh, you know, transition from grid falling, falling inverter to grid forming inverter. And uh, one of the questions was raised was the tipping point, right? Uh, when does the system, that the grid becomes unstable uh, when the power electronic based generation reaches a certain level? And uh, I guess we'll talk about that uh, in the next couple of days. Uh, it's important this is happening. So uh, we, we need to understand that well before it's happening, otherwise we'll have a tremendous uh, uh, barrier there uh, to um, to grow the industry, right? Uh, so that's on, on the U.S. side. And the, on the right-hand side, this is a migrate project that we started, uh, I think, a little bit after the, the Sunland project. And they were asking the question, similar question, and uh, so they had the, that, you know, two pathways. One is from the existing infrastructure or free framework of a grid. And obviously you can add some flexibility to the grid. You can add some uh, other controls, uh, and, but still uh, you will reach, two minutes, you will reach a, 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 a point where the grid becomes unstable. Or you can start from a totally new paradigm. You start saying, let's start with 100% uh, penetration power uh, electron based system. And then you back off, you relax the, the, the constraint, and you are at a uh, point. But uh, that's an interesting concept. I think of, of these two projects have linked uh, recently and uh, kind of crystallized some of these uh, ideas for us. Um, so my last slide, this is my last slide. This is uh, a work that I did uh, probably some 20 years ago when I was a PhD student. So I, we look at the... Uh, uh, a back converter, a very simple back converter, and they look at uh, if you, uh, it's a nonlinear circuit, right? So if you look at the, the uh, behavior of the circuit, the dynamic behavior of the circuit, at some point, once it was just a parameter, it started from uh, a steady state, right, a fixed point, into some pure doubling, if you look at, you know, the logic schema, you know, pure doubling, doubling. And when it gets to a point where pure three, if you know the famous paper, Pure split three implies chaos. So, um, so that is a, you know shows that nonlinear dynamics, uh, dynamically nonlinear systems is very tricky, very complex, um, and even for for the power electronics because of a lot of switching, uh, you actually can get into weird situations. That we have to be careful about uh, you know uh, tuning the parameters, especially when you have a large system of those power electronics. Uh, it's very complex. I mean, this is uh, why I personally am this is my, one of my favorite topics. So with that, uh, I will close my uh, presentation. Thank you very much.
Any questions for Glory? <coughs> So I have a, a question that we need to talk about penetration levels and how you know how how much uh, renewables are able to be operated. I think we need to sort of change the, the question a little bit and say how often do we have to curtail those leases because that's what's going to really affect how they really can play into the market. And I think also if we start to look at some of these scenarios where we have uh, people saying they want more than 100 uh, percent generation. So you may actually be storing more than you're actually providing to load. So now you're actually going above 100%. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, um, we need to be a little bit careful about how we say we're there already. Because I think things get a lot more. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so this goes back, goes back to what Mark said in terminology, right? Um, so in our Energet 4, we actually put in the parameter we call it like a greater than 100% penetration, instantaneous penetration, just because there's export, there's a storage, right? Those options are there. Uh, so we, we do have to have, uh, I mean, one of the goals here is uh, uh, to get, maybe get some uh, understanding and discussion about the penetration level um, and uh, more than 100%. I mean, all these, uh, you know, whether it's a utility or state or, you know, or even a city, even a country, right, in Europe, they are 100%, but that doesn't mean that 100% uh, independent system, right? They always connect to something outside, right? So they can export, they can import. So that is not equivalent to 100% we were talking about, right? When you have a 100% system that you have to operate, you know, 24 7, 365, that's a totally different ballgame. And this is why, uh, you know, we have to be careful about what we mean by 100%. 100% in the city is easy, or, you know, in the small country is easy, but uh, I would say easy, relatively speaking, but we have. We, you know, as a US, it's very hard to get to 100%. But uh, let me just want to add one more thing. So forget about the, 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 uh, the media uh, portrayal, you know, the, the politics uh, and that sort of thing. As engineers, as a researcher, I think we are interested in uh, solving that, uh, you know, technology challenge. I mean, when Brian said this is a grand challenge, I, I do think that that is not an understatement. I think that is uh, uh, probably a good statement that uh, we need to look at this as a grand challenge and uh, uh, we want to have a solution whether it you know deployment aside we, we know that this will get to the higher level and we want to have a solution uh, when that kind of time comes so that's where we are so there's another question up here is anything else I mean maybe time for one more question Hi, uh, this is not a technical question. Uh, what is your office's uh, uh, responsibility or, or involvement with the SBIR side of the solar integration? Because I'm uh, aware there's current SBIR right. uh, solar side of work. So right. I'm just curious, what's your involvement? Yeah, so SBIR is a unique program in the DOEs. Uh, every office has to contribute a certain amount our investment uh, uh, in SBIR, and it covers all the technologies that we're funding. Um, so yeah, we do we do uh, put in topics for SBIR, we review them, and uh, uh, but it's a different program um, that, that DOE as a whole is running. Okay, we can talk offline if you just want to know more about it. Great, let's take Guohi one more time. Okay. Okay, so we're going to take a, a break here and just a couple comments before we do that. Uh, I do want to reflect a little bit on the way the agenda is put together and, and how we organize this. So if you look at the title of the workshop, you say grid forming inverters. So you might think, oh, okay, this is a workshop. We're just going to be talking about uh, just inverters and power electronics and with a very uh, precise focus. But it's actually not what we've done to uh, reflect the nature of this grand challenge aspect of what we're doing. There are things at various scales that we need to discuss and talk about. So that's why we have speakers that are covering, you know, everything from bulk systems all the way down to the power electronics. So I think that will also give us a, 
room to have fertile discussion once we see all those different vantage points. Okay, so um, the, the way this is kind of set up is we kind of set the stage here, I think, with these first couple talks here. And now we'll start getting a bit more into the, the technical depth as we move on. Uh, so we also have um, half hour breaks here. So this is also meant to facilitate discussion and you know, get to know one another. So, so please enjoy the, the next half hour and uh, mingle with your neighbors and, um, and we'll reconvene here in uh, 28 minutes or so. Thank you.